Yeah. Okay, do we see the screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Affirmative. Yeah, so basically why use 3D printing? Uh, it's basically uh, a lot of times you can make a custom part that you don't have. Um, you can improve an existing part by adding like features to it. Or you can get it now instead of waiting. There's some even fairly simple astronomy parts that there's a lot of stuff you can't get now because of the, I don't know what it is, the, the shipping or whatever from China. Um, the really cool thing is, is what's called complexity is cheap. Yeah, in regular manufacturing, like every time you add a hole or tap a hole or do something, it costs you to do that. But in 3D printing, a lot of the times those extra features, they actually don't cost you anything at all. So if you basically made a flat plate, you know, that that costs more in 3D printing. But if you put 15 different holes in it, in manufacturing, it say it costs you, you know, 50 cents a hole, by the time you get up to 20 holes, it's quite a bit, but with the printing, it doesn't cost you anything because it just detours around. And if you get replacement parts for out of service parts, that's a kind of a new use that people are doing too. So um, I got a little graph of how it works. There's many types of 3D printing and this assumes um, what's called uh, fused filament fabrication. In other words, a filament goes in through a heated nozzle and gets squeezed out like toothpaste onto a plate. And the nozzle moves in the X and Y direction and up and down to create the part. There's other types that use laser light. There's, you know, you can make metal parts. There's lots of stuff, but this is the type that's really common because it's the cheapest right now for consumers and it's what we have, you know, so. Um, I think I gotta print, press a button here, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, consumer grade 3D printing materials in order of kind of use and popularity. And there's basically PLA, which is polylactic acid. It's very popular. Uh, it has a low uh, heat distortion or heat deflection temperature. So you gotta be careful if you're using it in situations where it gets uh, quite a bit of temperature. PETG or polyethylene terephthalate glycol is a uh, higher heat resistant than PLA. It's basically the stuff that they make oh, like, uh, like pop bottles out of. Um, and then there's thermoplastic rubber. So you can make like eye cups and things like that. Uh, carbon fiber filled uh, PLA, PETG and nylon. Nylon especially, it's very stiff. ASA is a material that's very good for outdoor use. Um, that's also used sometimes in eyeglass frames, but if there's a lot of concern about the weather or the ultraviolet light breaking down plastic, that's a good choice. Nylon is a great choice except for the processing issues because uh, first of all, it has to be dried or so, Typically you buy it dried, but then once you open the bag, it absorbs moisture from the air. But it's a very, it's a higher heat, but it's also very tough. It has a very high impact relative to like PLA. And polycarbonate is probably the highest that consumer grade, but there's also people that use even higher temperature materials like old TEM or something, but you need specialized even for polycarbonate and nylon, typically you'll need a little different um, extrusion setup on your printer. And um, 
ways to keep the materials from absorbing moisture from the air. But th this is kind of in the order of difficulty. So typically most people print like with the top three, you know, materials, you know. Um, design, um, if you replace a steel or aluminum part um, and you just change the shape, don't change the shape, uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's always a good idea to check and see if you have a strength issue or at least be aware of that because, um, let me see, I think steel typically is, has a tensile strength that yield a minimum around 50 or 60,000 pounds per square inch. Um, aluminum, I don't remember, that might be 10 or, no, that might be, that might be 15,000 or something, but, but um, plastics maybe eight to 10,000 PSI. So um, weaker, and as far as the stiffness or the modulus, the plastics are uh, probably an order of magnitude or more softer than a, than a aluminum piece. But a lot, of, a lot of amateur astronomy parts, they really don't need a lot of high strength. So we'll take a look at some examples and um, show you what's, what's possible. So, um, so I've got a couple of examples here. Um, the part on the left is a holder for a hand controller for an Orion um, equatorial alt azimuth combination mounts. And on the right is the part that, that came with the mounts, right? But it's basically kind of a pain in the neck. There's kind of a strap that goes around it and it's got Velcro, you tighten it up and then it loosens and it kind of became a real problem. And it's one of the first things I started that I actually designed as opposed to just um, copying a design off the web. So I took, you know, the dimensions of this part on the outside, and then I just adapted it um, so that I could, um, instead of using a, um, a web, it's got like a clip on it that wedges in there. So you take the holder and the clip and you put them together and you'll, you'll see. Um, I made a little video this afternoon that probably shows that a little bit better. So I'll just be quiet and let you hear this, so. Okay, here's the old mount holder for the hand controller. It's all loose and everything and slides down because it's a piece of stupid webbing. You put the hand controller in there. It's kind of not so great. Now here's the new improved holder. It's a bright orange, so I can actually see it in the dark. There's a little clip on here that just goes in there, but it's really robust. And once you squeeze the clip, it's in there like a son of a gun. And when you throw the controller, the hand, hand controller in there, it stays put and it's not flopping around like a fish in the water. <laughs> okay, here's the old. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna click on the design a little bit so that we can see that this link brings up the, uh, the model that I drew up in CAD. It's a web-based CAD program, but, you know, basically you see what you got. You know, this is, that's the, I don't know, peer, the adapter or the peer adapter for the, right, here's the clip. And here's the controller. So you can see how it clips on inside and it kind of slides in there. So anyhow, um, let me see, what's the next thing that we, oh yeah, here's the solar viewfinder. I think I've handed out a couple of those. Um, 
and that was kind of adapted off of a current of, of a part, but I modified the design. And I got to go back. Oh yeah, I got the video. Roll tape. the solar viewfinder and notice as you try to find the center there you have it centered okay here's the okay so um the next thing up this is a uh, a Los Mandy style dovetail mounting plate that's nine inches long and let's see, go back. Get us at a situation at his observatory where instead of having a standard plate, and so I said, well, first thing is you really need like this plate on. He wanted to mount a camera on there a little more robust, but the design of this plate, um, I think Stellar View is pretty interesting that a lot of times they have blueprints on their website that shows you what their parts are and we have the dimensions so I just made this up in in um, 3D and Geddes actually printed on his own printer and one of the concerns he had was is that he didn't want to have too much deflection for his camera so on the left is the deflection of the thinner standard plate, which is not huge. It's only about two thousandths of an inch. And then we thickened it up to like, I don't know, like seven eighths. And the deflection is like, I don't know. I don't know, it's like six or six ten thousandths or hundred thousandths. It's the, the colors are the same, but it's, it's deflection is like a 10th of, what it was, there you go, from two thousandths to six ten thousandths, and that was the thickness change. So, um, so in conjunction with that, we made a camera mount, and it was modeled after this Los Bandy single axis mount. And the whole thing only cost about ten dollars, even after you throw in the materials and parts, and it's like sixty dollars you know, if you buy it. Um, the knobs, I used knobs designs from McMaster Car, and they have knobs that you can buy that are plastic knobs and you heat up a bolt um, and then you insert the bolt. So basically I just, I just can copy their, their digital data off the web and print the knob, heat the bolt, insert the knob, and you get a knob. And the thing I liked about it is that I can make a custom knob where the bolt size is exactly what I want to be. So here's a picture. Here's the CAD picture of the, um, of the camera mount that slides on a Lozmandy uh, or a D-style plate. And then here's the actual thing that was, that was manufactured. I think later I upgraded the knob from the round style to this bar style. But uh, the interesting thing is that I was able to incorporate into this knob one of the features that Los Mandy has is there's another set of threads on the knob. So you screw it in and the threads go in partially and then it captures the knob. So the knob's always captured. And then when you put your camera on, you just screw it in. So. Um, mm -hmm. Here's, here's the same camera mount with an old Canon EOS Rebel that I've got. And um, I, made another, I made another copy of it and it's out at the observatory, but anytime somebody wants to put a digital single lens reflex camera on there, it's, it's there, it's available. And so, so what's next? Um, Mike Arada, he's the anonymous Fort Wayne Astronomical Society member. He had a problem because he didn't have a good spot to put his finder along with the star sense on his scope, but he had a set of rings 
on his refractor. So the first thing we did is we just found a finder shoe. Um, the existing ones didn't have a through hole to mount on the rings. So we just printed a finder shoe with a new through hole. And that was pretty easy. But then after I started thinking about it, I liked the idea of building a, um, like a bar, but a Vixen style bar that dovetail that would mount the camera and or a guide scope and you could put both a finder a finder and a star sense on there and the finder shoe instead of mounting it separately you could incorporate it into the bar so mm -hmm. the super bar was born dun, dun, dun. and here's the first the first iteration before the super bar this is the ring for um the Orion rings that are on Mike's telescope. And this is a almost standard um, finder shoe. The instead of slotted holes, I've got countersunk holes that are gonna um, they work are gonna work a little better in plastic. And then the white one is the one I printed out and you can see it holding a star sense. A bracket on it. Then here's a picture of the the super bar, and this is just a standard finder scope. This is the camera, and this is the super bar. And you notice that the instead of having the standard Vixen dovetail bar that comes through here, basically with the magic of 3D printing, we've sort of glued in as part of the bar on this end and on this end to shoes for the finders, you know. So you got your, you got your uh, star sense and you got your finder all in one bar and you got a place for your camera or you can put a guide scope on there. Then there's five threaded holes and the original, this initial one didn't have a threaded hole in the center, but you could even mount something else here if you really want to. So, um, so that was the super bar. So then I started thinking about, uh, I have a scope. It's a four inch scope. That's the stellar view um, scope that I've got. Um, stellar view had ring dimensions out on their website but the OD of the rings was thinner because it was basically metal. So I revised the OD to fit the super bar. Um, and then the 3D printing let me make the hinge in one piece, which was a really cool thing. Instead of having to assemble it with separate pieces and hardware, I don't need any hardware. I just, I just print it all. Um, the clevis pin and the hinge pins were a little skinny um, compared to the steel parts. And in fact, I found out they were, um, especially the clevis pin would, this, the threads would strip out if I over torqued them. And so I ran FEA, FEA is short for finite element analysis. It's just a mathematical way of figuring out how much stress is on stuff. Um, and then while I was at it, I said, well, heck, if I got two, I got a finder on the left and a finder on the right, why not put a red dot finder foot and kind of glue that onto the ring? And then at that time, it's getting a little crowded. So I rotated the whole rings about 15 degrees. So I didn't have a clearance issue with the knobs. Um, and I started having, finding little different problems. So I made a little, well, it's not going to go backwards. Okay. It's supposed to. Yeah, there we go. So I made a little log. It's like a design log, you know? So, you know, like the first one was if I over torqued the lock knob, I broke the clevis pin. Make it larger. Okay. And I reduced the stress from 1700 to 550 PSI. And it's the pin's not breaking. Yay. Right. Um, there was this a gap and you know so 
the hinge was too loose, you know, had to decrease the, the gap in the hinge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so anyways, I caught all the issues, I fixed them all. And basically now I've got a set of rings for about $9. If you buy a genuine set of Stellar Views, it's 180, but you could probably get another set of something else that's like 90 bucks, but I think these are pretty cool. Um, and it's, um, and then in addition, I built a mounting bar. The rings are built out of just PLA about 50% what they call 50% infill. So it's supposedly about 50% plastic, but it's actually a little more than that. Um, the mounting bar that the whole scope is clamped to the telescope mount really needs to be sturdy. So that's 100% and that's, that's uh, carbon fiber filled uh, PLA. Let me see if I can get it next. Okay. So, when you take the rings and you twist them, um, I had some concern that, uh, that somebody is gonna open this thing up, not necessarily me, but if I ever, you know, print them up for other people. Sometimes I'm not sure how careful other, other people are, but you know, I don't want something that's very fragile. So if you twist it about 10 or 15 pounds, is it gonna break? Well. I twisted a set and they broke, you know? So that's telling me something. So we ran the analysis and I was about 9,000 PSI, which is basically the breaking strength of the PLA. And I did a bunch of changes and I got it down to about 6,000. You're really not supposed to twist them, put 20 pounds on them sideways, but it's kind of nice, you know, that it's a little more robust. Um, here's a, Here's kind of like a CAD view of what what it looks like on the, on the four inch scope. And it's fairly similar to what you saw with Mike's setup. You can see here. Here's the mounting foot for the red dot finder. You know, yeah. yeah what else? Oh, okay, here's the mounting bar, right? And let's see what else do I got. Oh yeah, so here we go. Here's the scope with all the stuff on it, you know? Yeah. So those are your unlocked no uh, knobs and there's the super bar, the wonder bar with the, the finder and the star sense and there's the mounting underneath, so. And there's some details here. This is the clevis pin that I had to thicken up to um, keep from breaking and the threads pulling out. And this is the finder area. And this is, this is the, the threaded piece. And this, this section is about twice as thick as what you normally have in an aluminum one because otherwise the, strip, the threads can strip out. And here, I'll show you, this is what the hinge looks like. Here's a previous spring set I made showing the integral hinge. The hinge is 3D printed as part of the ring set. You can also see the three mounting tapped hole locations and the center tapped hole locations that are printed with the tapped holes in it. Here's a previous. Okay. Oh, and then here's something else that uh, Joe Novosel asked me to do for him, and I haven't got it to him, but uh, he was needing a Botnikov mask. So they had one online. A lot of these things don't have to have a tremendous amount of design. There's people out there that make these. So I've basically found an existing mask that kind of clips on the inside. Um, and the, the guy that built it said that it worked really well and stuck in there. And then obviously I scaled it so I can tell the printer to make it like whatever size, like instead of this being three inches, it could be six inches or 10 inches, you know, up to the size of the printer. 
So didn't need any engineering and it's size to fit in. Basically cost about 15 cents in material. So I made a couple of them different size. We'll see how they work, you know, so. Um, and then these are, these are knobs that I created for the, basically the camera mount project, right? And let's see how they're built. They're, they're basically printed and then you heat up this one of the bolts lightly and you just press it in. Um, so you can get whatever knob, right, you want. And here are some parts from other amateur astronomers. On cloudy nights, um, they had a whole couple pages. And here's a set of uh, finder scope rings, uh, a set of binocular covers with uh, not an integral, but it's got a hinge, you know. And here's a very interesting smartphone binocular finder. I'm going to click on the link and we can take a look at that. Let's see what we got. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff here. Here's somebody made a dual dovetail mounting bracket. Um, not sure what this one is. Um, oh, that's an, that looks like, uh, that might be something Peter's interested. Looks like he's got an inclinometer. Uh, okay. Rubber eye cups for binoculars mm. um, that were 3D printed. It fits on Teleview. And, and incidentally, a lot of these guys will have a, a link. Yeah, you can see the rubber eye cups. Yeah. And Yeah, so you can get the files to print those. So, um, wow, this guy's got the ones with the wings even. Yeah, look at that. Um, this, is the, this is the binocular setup that was pretty interesting. Um, he's basically, he's got a holder for his smartphone with a cover that goes over it and his software is like sky safari or whatever is uses the inclinometer in the smartphone to determine where he's pointing it at the sky and here's the parts Uh, and there he's showing, if you look carefully, he's got a Sky Atlas 2000, which, you know, some of us think those are sort of obsolete, but you can see his star pattern is pretty darn close to what he sees through there. So he's basically, he'll look through the binoculars and he can just get a matching view through his smartphone, which is pretty slick, you know. Um, this is an adapter for a apparently a Rokinon F2 and it, it adapts his, I think it's a, uh, he's got a, like a Fuji, uh, right, he's got a, he's you're right, he's got a lens adapter to a ZWO camera. And he talks a little bit about that. He's got a bayonet mount here. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is the GSO 50 millimeter finder scope bracket that we talked about previously. And there we, he's got it all set up on his telescope. So um, that's like a vent tube for a 
like a Dobson. And here's somebody's actually printed up a gear that's apparently working. That's interesting. The bino covers that we talked about earlier are here. Hmm. Okay, so that's the cloudy nights. And parts from other amateurs. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, well, we went to GrabCAD right away. If you go to the GrabCAD website, a lot of times you can find models. And there's lots of pages of models. There's another Botnitov mask. Um, and there's about four or five pages of things. Some of these aren't 3D prints, but like here's a here's right here's an A mount to one and a quarter reducer, something like that. I think would not be an issue in 3D printing. Mm -hmm. There's an iPhone, some sort of iPhone adapter, right? A C mount adapter, a Skywatcher, something. The config configurable botnitov masks, right? So that just gives you an idea. Um, uh, Thingiverse, that's another site. These are these are items that I've sort of collected <laughs> over the years. This is this is where I got the mask for the Joe ask, but there's a couple different kinds. Um, there's a lithophane moon lamp. You got to have that in your at your bedroom to keep you keep you awake at night. <laughs> Model of Jupiter, a mechanical planetarium in Orary. Yeah. Um, here's something very simple that's probably useful: is an eyepiece holder, a laser bracket. A tablet mount for your telescope, right? And here's a dovetail shoe, another botnitov, laser pointer. And this was quite this was quite interesting. I saw this early on. Here's another laser pointer adapter, a barn door tracker for astrophotography, 3D printed. Here, you get yourself an eight inch mirror and you can build an entire telescope out of 3D parts and some rods and stuff. Amazing, mm. amazing. Okay, all right, let's see what else. Oh, help. I need a something. Okay, so what do you, what do, you do? If somebody, if you guys need something printed, well, if you got a file, uh, send it to me and I can print it. If it's astronomical, it's less than, I don't know, maybe 10 bucks, I don't know. Um, and if you need more, more stuff, we could just add some dollars or you can add some dollars to your account, basically make a donation to the society. And anything we can print it for material cost, and we just put astro items at the top of the queue. If you need design help, I can help you out. Um, and the material inventory, maintenance, and prints, I put that in a there's a 3D log that I have that kind of lists all that stuff. Um, so that about concludes the uh, program here, and I'm going to take questions. Uh, and stop the screen share for right now. Okay. Oh, I wanted to show you something. My wife got me for anniversary too. <laughs> this, she got me a t-shirt with obviously the Andromeda galaxies printed on here. And when I turned sideways, she said to me, well, actually she didn't, I did, but she said, you know, Andromeda galaxy has a very pronounced central bulge, you know? <laughs> oh, I just thought I'd point that out, you know. I'm trying to get the bulge down, but uh, thanks for bearing with me, guys. You got any questions that I can 
I'd like to make a comment, Jim. I, yeah, I really enjoyed the talk. I appreciate you putting it yeah. together. But, uh, yeah, I bought my uh, refractor from Geddes uh, last year and then got a, a star sets that uh, Jim was talking about. And that comes with two mounting brackets. One, a large one and a smaller one, but neither would, my scope wouldn't accommodate either one. I did not have any capability of screwing these brackets into my scope. And so I was in kind of a dilemma. Talked to Jim and he might want to get some adhesive and attach you know, the base to that. Could consider maybe making some screw holes and you know with the drill and the in the scope and yeah it didn't sound too appealing to me but uh, then he came up with his design for that base plate that absolutely was perfect to to connect it to the ring it was simple for, in his mind to do that but uh, he had a central screw hole rather than the the slots that came with the, from the manufacturer and absolutely perfect solution to the problem. And so I want to thank, you know, Jim for doing that. Then he took it a step further, like he showed you with the mount that uh, other mount that can accommodate a camera, finder scope and star sense too, which uh, pretty amazing how well that actually fit onto my scope. So thanks, Jim. I tell you, you're a big help. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, you you can buy stuff sometimes, but sometimes it's nice to be able to mod things, you know. So, but yeah. thanks. Thanks for your words here. Hey, uh, Jim, you list a whole bunch of different kinds of material there that you can use. Yes. How many, I guess there's a PLA and some other stuff. How many of those can you print with our printer? Um, with the printer we have, we can print the PLA. We can print the PETG. We can print carbon filled PLA, which is, it's about almost two and a half to three times stiffer than regular PLA and that's what I print like the mounting bars and things like that. Um, nylon maybe with some difficulty. It's a temperature related thing plus you have to dry it and I really mm -hmm. don't want to deal with it but you know it's doable to do that and the polycarbonate takes 300 degrees so the the extruder head is limited to about 240 centigrade. So mm -hmm. that's almost at the range of the nylon. But yeah. you, you have two, two, two or three problems is with higher temperature materials, it's nice to enclose them in an enclosure and probably heat the enclosure. And also the drying issue is that um, you know, normally in industry, you would heat, you would take the material, put it in a controlled temperature oven, for three or four hours, drive out the moisture, and then you put it in a hermetically sealed box and feed that out through a grommet to the machine, you know? And I, I did that in a previous life, you know, where I worked, but, mm -hmm. you know, you could do it as an amateur, but it just, yeah. it's just try to avoid doing that. But, but yeah, you could upgrade the extruder to like a metal, what they call a metal hot end for another hundred dollars or something. And, and then mm -hmm. you have to, you still have to dry the material and so forth. So it's doable, but you but know, most most of your products there were probably done with uh, what one or two types of material. Yeah, one just about just types. about everything is. I've been using PLA because we're not like in Tucson, Arizona, and most guys yeah. are not taking our scope and they're not like putting it out. You know, like you know, we're not in Florida, but we're not letting our scopes bake out in the, out in the sun for hours. And we're, we're, we're using it at night and it's relatively cool, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm basically using the PLA, the carbon fiber for something that needs to be really stiff. And I haven't used the PETG. Yeah. So 
you know, if it's easy to print and it doesn't cause me any trouble, why not? The orange knobs are made out of this material called PLA plus, which is supposed to be about another 10 to 20 degrees um, better heat resistant. Uh, process is nice mm. and I like the orange color, you know, but yeah, 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 shows up that's, well. that's what it is, you know, so. Jim, what size did you say the uh, Bantenoff masks were? I, because I, we talked about an 80, a mask for the 80 millimeter finder scope. Right. When we measured those, I yeah. took up, I took a piece of paper and I also went around the outside of the ring and creased it. So I've got like an imprint on a piece of paper. So I was roughly measuring about 83 oh. and a half millimeter ID. Okay. But you didn't make a 16 inch mask though for the uh, no, for I, the main. I can't, the, okay. Right, the printer, the printer has a diameter on the printing plate of about, I think 260 millimeters, which is a little bit over 10 inches. So that's, I misunderstood that's the, the slide. It, it was for the 16 inch. It wasn't to mount on the 16 inch. No, okay, now it's I'm, for that finder scope on the 16 inch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, right. I, I've, I've seen some clever things out there where some people have, have made things that are larger than the printer by they basically slice it into one or even four sections and it clips together. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if it gets to be that much trouble, okay. maybe, maybe do it, buy it or do something different, but you know, whatever. Right. We'll give it a, we'll give that mask a try next time uh, we have a chance. Yeah. Well, Tuesday, I'm going to plan on being at the board meeting at least. Um, and I've forgotten if I got something. I got to check with the boss if I got a schedule on the weekend. I forgot there was something on the weekend. So for yeah. Saturday. Another question is, have you made any gears? I have not made gears, no. Because I'm thinking about this spectroscope, and it's just a bear to, to, to get it vertically, properly uh rotated so that it has a, a vertical spectra. Yes. And if there was a mechanism that could be made to sort of clamp on and hold it in place and you could just, you know, turn a knob and, and make the thing move very slightly, I could uh, I could see that being real handy. Yeah, I mean- it's Just a simple clock mechanism. Yeah, the next time I'm out there, we could take a look at it. I, I would probably, you, you probably could, I would probably, recommend we look at something and maybe you you might even be, you can buy some simple gears at like i don't know what is it stock drive products sdp or something they have like i don't know hundred thousand gears or something <laughs> you know whether you want a herringbone or a straight or whatever you know yeah and, and i could see making some uh, encoder mounts some custom encoder mounts exactly for, uh, any type, anything, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see doing that. Yeah, I mean, if to sketch if you, something up when I want some time. Yeah, just just think about it, right? Yeah, I can see a few uses. It, it looks really handy. Yeah, 